I spent uh, a good part of last week in, on retreat. And I, I spent time there with two books. One called With Burning Hearts by Andre Newman, a short book. So when I read it to you in its entirety, <laughs> and this was the other one. And I looked at the passage for today, and I thought it really needed to start with the story that precedes where Linda began reading. Because there is a story that I think we are all very familiar with and have heard probably since we were children. And yet, it's probably one of the not so comfortable stories that we read in Mark. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before Jesus and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Did y'all ask that question when you were kids? I know I did. I think the first time I asked it, I was about four. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I remember saying to my dad, you know what, if Adam and Eve hadn't messed up, we'd all still be in the Garden of Paradise. We wouldn't have to deal with all this stuff. I was about four. But anyway, all about eternal life. Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, steal, bear false witness, you shall not defraud, and honor your father and mother. And the young man said to him, Teacher, I have kept all of these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, you lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, the man was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. And then we get the part where Jesus looks at the disciples and he says how hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And I thought, wow, isn't that comforting? Isn't that comforting? Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom. Do you know what the eye of the needle is? Well, it isn't what you think it is. I'll tell you that. It isn't even what you think you think it is if you think it wasn't what you first thought it was and I think it's something else. It's neither of those. Okay? It's not the eye of a needle. And... Uh, we thought for a while that it referred to the door that was in the larger gate that went into Jerusalem. And because there was a smaller door inside the larger gate in order to get a camel through, the thought was you had to unpack the camel to get the camel through that smaller door. Kind of thinking that's what you think it is, right? Well, guess what? That's not what it is either. <laughs> Somebody made that up in the 19th century so we could spiritualize this passage. Isn't that pretty cool? No. Because I was going to preach on that, and then I went, oh, wow, I guess I won't preach on that now. Not to worry. There's plenty of other stuff to preach on today. So we still don't know what it means? What, what we assume it means is that we have to unpack whatever it is that we've packed on, whether it's to a camel or to ourselves in order to get into the kingdom. Which could be a lot of stuff. What? Do you know, it doesn't, stuff. it doesn't need to be material stuff, although it could be material stuff. 
You know, every time I think I'm over materialistic thinking and that I've gotten beyond that, all I have to do is come out of the grocery store and find somebody's grocery cart up against the car door. <laughs> and then I'm not feeling like I'm over it anymore. <laughs> We talked about this passage last Advent when Steve Blinder led an Advent series and he said, you know, I just can't do that piece about giving up everything. This is from the man who, when he buys shoes, buys them in every color they exist. <laughs> I just let you know. So what do we do with this passage? What is it that at the end or near the end it says, for mortals... It is impossible. But for God, all things are possible. I spend a lot of time thinking about what it is I'm being called to give up so that someone else can have life. If you thought that those kind of ideas presented themselves only in our pre-social media days, all you have to do is spend about 10 minutes on Facebook and see them coming up in new ways <coughs> in social media. Do you remember being a child and you were told you had to eat the peas and carrots or whatever it was, that whatever the, the vegetable of abhorrence was in your house? Because there were poor children in India started. Okay. It was always four children yeah. in India. It wasn't four children in China or Thailand or South Africa. Of course, South Africa wasn't South Africa then. But it was always the poor children in India. <coughs> Did that really like help you eat whatever that vegetable of importance was? It didn't really help much for us in our house. I have to say, the really neat thing about the kitchen in my parents' home was that the table was near a low window. And so if there was really anything you didn't want, you just kind of tucked it there on the windowsill and left it covered up with the bottom drapes and curtains or whatever they were and, and hoped it wasn't discovered until you had time to dispose of it in a more appropriate way. Sometimes we got caught out, other times we didn't. So, so this idea of, of giving up something has been with, it uh, seems like a lot of us, since childhood, there was a value that was instilled in us, that whole idea of sharing. You know, that's, not, that's the idea of tithing. I, I spent time with um, one of the people from uh, Building and Loan, and, and she, she would say, you know what, when my mother explained tithing to me as a child, I thought it was a really good deal. Because she said to me, for every dollar you get, you get to keep 90 cents and you have to give 10 cents to God. And she said, what a good deal that is. What a good deal that is. Well, I wasn't brought up in a household of tithing, so I didn't know that. I was brought up in a household where my father gave us all nickels to put in the collection plate. Did you have that experience? Yeah. Okay. Now, I used to, I had, at that time, two older brothers and a younger brother and an infant sister who didn't come to church. And so my younger brother and I knew that my father always stopped at the corner store on the way home to get a newspaper, which also had candy in it. So we would time it so that the guy coming up to collect or coming down to collect the money would be like one or two rows ahead of us when we would somehow drop the nickels and have to search for them until the guy was past us. So it got to the point of embarrassment for my father who said to us, put the nickels in the basket, I'll buy you a candy bar anyway. <laughs> So you can see I've always had this kind of warring soul about what do I do with, with giving up and, and giving and giving away. Um, and you know, today it seems like there are just so many good places where we can spend our dollars. Do you know? There are just so many good places, so many good causes. And I get them in the mail, and you all probably do too. And they come with presents now, so you feel guilty, right? Like I got a pair of socks from the Humane Society this week. I don't know anybody else. Yeah, socks with dogs and cats on them. They're really pretty. I'll wear them some week. Um, but what do we do with this whole notion? What is it 
that God's calling us to do? What is it that God is calling us to give, I think not up, but to share, to give away? That kind of, I think, is the notion. And I still think there's some something harbored in the back of our little heads about there's this one really cool thing in my life that I'll give up everything but that. I read the story of a little girl who uh, went to like a, a Walmart or something with her mother, and she said, I'd like this string of pearls. And the mother says, well, it's $1.98, and you need to save the money to do that. And your birthday's next week, and maybe your grandma will give you a dollar, and then you can save the difference, and I'll have you do chores. And so the little girl earned a dollar ninety-eight, went to Walmart's and bought the string of pearls, which she never took off her neck, except when she took a bath because her mother said it might turn her neck green, but she didn't. Do so y'all have those kind of? I've had jewelry like that. I don't know if y'all have. They used to win it at the at the carnival that came through town. I don't know about you. And, and so her dad would go in every night, and and he'd read her a story, which is was what he always did. And he'd say to her, "There's only one thing more." And she'd say, "I love you, I love you." She says, "I love you too." But can I have your string of pearls? And she said, "No, you can't have my string of pearls. Here, you can have this, you know, little lamb of mine. You know, it's my favorite stuffed animal." And you can have that. And the dad said, no, you keep it. I just wanted your string of pearls. And he went in night after night. And the next night, she offered him her favorite doll and different things. And finally, one night, he goes in, and he reads the story, and she's crying. And he said, what's the matter? She goes, Daddy, here is my string of pearls that I want you to have. And when she did that, he took a blue velvet box out of his pocket that he had been carrying with him for weeks. And he opened it up, and he gave her of string of real pearls for her and lives. I think that's what this story is about. I think it's about our thinking we want the string of pearls that we could buy for $1.98 that could turn our next green <coughs> and we can't give it up because we really, really want that. And then when we discover we can let go of whatever it is, materially, that we give that up, that there's some greater gift we receive. I kept thinking about this passage, and I thought, I, I could probably give up almost any material thing if I, if I needed to. But I don't know if I could give up the people in my life. I know when my allergist asked me to give up our dog and two cats, I couldn't do that. And I will say this about that experience. When you find you have to give back to God, what is God? Whoever it is you love that dear, you get a great gift for return. It is not a gift without tears, like the little girl in the pearls. It is not a gift without heartache and heartbreak. But it is a gift that never ends. It is the gift of knowing somehow that your beloved going home to God is gift for you. Amidst our tears and within our pain, We know that God does not abandon us at the end of this life. If you look around, you will see people in this congregation who have already had life after life experiences. You don't have to go see the movie unless you want to. 
who can tell you that Jesus is real, that God is not alive, and that there is this amazing journey beyond this journey with happiness beyond language we can create. I think what is possible for God is God helping us learn that we can give back what was only entrusted to us <coughs> was given to us to care for, was given to us to love. And as in God's greatest gift of love, we give it back. And in the giving back, there is, at some point, peace that passes all <coughs> understanding. The young man, I think, in this story comes to Jesus because there's something missing. He's got all this stuff. He's got all this money. All the wealth that you can imagine for somebody in the first century. But there's something missing. Do you remember being a little kid when it wasn't missing? when you really knew how much God loved you. And then we grow up and somehow forget that life. And so I spent a good part of retreat reading with burning hearts. It's the story of the two unnamed disciples on the road to Emmaus and back, and the walk they take with Jesus, not knowing it's Jesus. And they talk about, among themselves, how there's something burning in their hearts. And Jesus is with them. <coughs> and if you remember the story, they recognize him when? In the breaking of the bread. They recognize him at that moment of communion. When our hearts and God's heart are in their closest contact. And in that moment, Jesus disappears from their sight. But their hearts are burning, and they remain burning through all that will happen for those earliest disciples and Christians. Our hearts are those same human hearts. <coughs> And they will continue burning. I hope that today you will, in that moment of communion with God, not be distracted by any long prayers of any of the prayers. But know that burning in your heart 
again. That flame that God so wants to fan into something that gives light and warmth and goodness to all those around us. For in receiving, we give. And in giving, we receive. What we know is that Jesus looks at this man with love and compassion. And even though the man leaves, it's not because he's not invited to stay. Communion is like that too. We are invited to be one, not only with Jesus Christ, but with the entire body of Christ. And for those whose lives and minds go beyond that, the whole human family, the whole created universe. Our hearts are <coughs> that you. At least I think they do. I know when I get off this merry-go-round of my busyness and take a few days of retreat, I know something is missing. I know it's not because God has abandoned me. I am invited as is each of us continually and continuously to be one with God, one in the body of Christ that is always and ever reaching out, not only so that all may be one, but so that all may be fed and not hungry, so all may be clothed and not naked so all may be free and not imprisoned by whatever holds them up. And when we get the grace of those moments, when we hand out that peanut butter and jelly sandwich with the apple, with the apple, not the banana. Oranges this week. No oranges this week, but I'm saying with the apple, what we want. Something burns in our hearts. That is our gift. That is our God spark within us that flames into passion and compassion. And I believe this scripture invites us to let that happen, to be one with God and not to go screaming around the grocery store you just came out of to find the person who slammed the cart into your car. Amen. 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 Amen.